Well, we're turning our focus to Europe. We want to take stock, of course, of the impact of Brexit. We want to look at the new trade agreements and what's required to create stronger regional supply chains, something that's been uh, in the press so much recently. So we have a lot to talk about. I'm delighted to welcome our panel. We have Dr. Pina Artiran, Dr. Anna Jerzetska, uh, Vonji Rajakoba and finally Sigrid de Vries. A very warm welcome to all four of you this morning. Thank you uh, so much for joining us. Um, I hope you were able to hear a little bit of that last panel. We um, uh, talked about some issues very relevant to this. But Sigrid, I think um, if we just start off um, with you, what is the new normal for European automotive, if we even have a new normal now in a, in a post-pandemic world? What, what does the industry look like? Well, that, that's a huge question to start with. Um, but thanks for having me on the panel. I think it's uh, very uh, interesting to have this debate and also very timely, of course. I think the new normal today, I mean, if you look at what occupies uh, the, our, our sector suppliers in, in the automotive industry, it's supply chain disruptions uh, and subsequent price increases also. They are the key uh, uncertainty of today. And it, it, this is about semiconductors, but also about steel, rubber, plastics. Uh, it's also about logistics, so the availability of, uh, of transport of containers. So uh, that, that's a huge thing. Um, many say it's bigger than uh, the fallout of the pandemic already has has been and, and it's expected also to last uh, well into 2022 and perhaps also in 2023. And then at the same time, of course, uh, there is electrification, accelerated electrification, there is digitalization. So there are all the investments in new technologies that need to be done uh, where, where revenues need to be earned also to make them happen. And this while uh, margins in, in, in the mature business lines, and that includes, of course, also internal combustion engine powertrains are under uh, increasing pressure. So, um, yeah, and then there are lots of regulations also coming towards industry and that still, of course, also impacts the UK industry beyond emission norms and Euro 7. There, there is a huge topic um, of, of sustainability. Uh, companies will, will address uh, how they manage their supply chains, um, supply chain due diligence, just to name one, but it's also about access to capital markets uh, with financial taxonomy. Uh, there is the corporate uh, sustainability reporting um, issues coming up. So, um, I mean, to, to maybe wrap it up, I'd say that, that many automotive suppliers face the challenge really of of having to change their business models in a time where society and policymakers are redefining their expectations of what it means to run a business itself. So it's it's monumental, I would say, the new normal. I'm so sorry to be throwing these huge questions at you that we could probably spend hours and hours discussing. But if, if the new normal is definitely not normal, isn't it? I think we I think we all we all understand that that there are so many lessons to learn. But looking at the ten months since the transition period, uh, what lessons have been learned in those ten months? Well, um, nobody was looking forward to to, to Brexit, right? Uh, it's not been the big bang in the end because there was time to prepare, but there has still been a quite a bit of of, uh, of of disruption. And I think many people on the business side have really discovered how complex customs procedures actually are. Uh, and they faced also disputes with, with OEMs on the fact that goods could not be transported tariff free when when headlines, in fact, in the newspapers were celebrating tariff free trade. So for customs experts, of course, there were fewer surprises. Um, there is there's a lot more paperwork involved um, and there is still also a lot of uncertainty around regulatory divergence. Um, so, yeah, I, I would say freight, trade sorry, is no longer frictionless um, and, and that's something that cannot be taken away by, by adjustments here and there. And, and I think it's really also worth noting that um, uh, both uh, the UK and the EU automotive imports and, and the share of foreign um, direct investments have been uh, continuously declining. So the impact is really there and, and that's also part of the new normal. I know we're going to talk a bit more about divergence a little bit later in the panel, but you just, um, Sigrid, mentioned you know, bringing in this specific sector, automotive. Have the issues that the sector has been facing been teething problems that can be sorted out or are they bigger problems? 
Well, I think fundamentally they're bigger problems because we're really trying to untangle, uh, you know, the internal market there that has really served the industry very well and also the European and UK economies. So there, there, no, I mean there are teething problems, no doubt. But I think uh, all actors, all parties in the in the system are are learning to to work with that and. Uh, it, it's just more work. I mean, you can't take that away either. The frictionless trade has become um, less. There's less of that. So there's more paperwork just to start with and, and more things to deal with. So um, those issues also won't go away. But the more fundamental issues are, I think, about how do we shape our our industries, both in the UK and, and at, on, on the continent. And um, yeah, these are very important questions because many people's livelihoods depend on this sector. It's a very important sector for Europe, but also for the UK. Um, it's about innovation. It's about, you know, how we will pay our, our pensions in the future. Uh, it's about global competitiveness. And, and on these issues, I think there is still a lot of mutual interest between the, uh, the UK and, and the EU because they're just also too big to face on our own. And looking specifically at how suppliers have adjusted to the new environment, uh, what, what would your report be if you were writing a school report on how they adjusted? How would you say they had done? You mean specifically uh, with regard to, to Brexit and the fallout of that or more generally? I mean, there's there have been so many challenges. I mean, we've had the pandemic. We, we now have the, the supply chain disruptions and distortions, as, as I say, I think um, yeah, Brexit in the end was just one of many items suppliers uh, had and still have to deal with. Uh, but I think, yeah, I don't want to be in, uh, at all disrespectful, but I think Brexit is the lesser concern in, in that overall picture. I, I don't think that's necessarily disrespectful. Um, Vonji, let me bring you in from the perspective of Bosch. What's your experience been like since the end of the transition period? Yes, thank you for having me in this uh, panel. Um, from a, uh, our perspective uh, at Bosch, what we've, we're still learning. What we've seen is additional complexity. Uh, of course, additional paperwork, as Sigrid has already mentioned, but also the rules of origin, uh, which is very complex for us in the automotive, um, specifically in the automotive sector. We've also uh, seen additional uh, uncertainty still with Northern Ireland. Um, this is still unclear between the EU and, um, and, um, uh, and the UK, but also the divergent regularity, uh, regularity, regulatory frame, sorry. Uh, that's still additional um, uncertainty that we face. And uh, last but not least, additional costs. You know, all this has generated direct costs on custom duties, but also on um, on brokers. All this has increased uh, in the last month. So we're still very, um, we're still learning on digesting all these um, additional challenges. One which is not often mentioned that we face is the, um, you know, absence of free mobility. We've got, um, we have associates who need to do testing in other uh, European countries. Today, there is no visa, for instance, which is appropriate for these workers to work abroad, specifically uh, in Germany. So you, you've got visa for people in the culture industry or in very specific industries, but for work, uh, workers or associates from the automotive sector, working in other European countries for a short, uh, short-term period, there we're still facing massive challenges. Yeah. So to summarize, we're still adjusting. Still it's too early to tell maybe, Bonji. <laughs> um, Anna, let's turn our attention um, to, to borders um, and customs observations. From the outside looking in, people might think it's all been quite uh, smooth sailing, that it's all gone according to plan, but you can tell us what it's really been like, um, you know, particularly for people in the automotive industry, trying to trying to cross borders, trying to uh, do uh, customs. What's the situation been like in the past few months? 
Uh, well, first of all, thank you for having me. I don't think many people think that it's all gone according to plan. I think if you read the newspapers, it's it's quite clear that there 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 were some hiccups, and we're still experiencing experiencing some issues. Uh, just to remind our viewers, uh, in terms of customs controls and and more specifically border controls, they haven't been introduced in the same way by the both sides. So the EU introduced border controls straight away, while the UK has this stage approach, which means that. Um, things are gradually being introduced and a range of Brexit specific custom simplifications. So in terms of the response or in terms of what's been happening on the ground, the first response, as, as was already mentioned, was confusion. It was quite a lot of confusion as to what's expected on both sides of the borders. On the UK side, the, the simplifications, um, while they were on one hand very helpful, they also caused a, a certain degree of, of confusion um, when it comes to uh, private sector's response. Rules of origin, something that's also been already mentioned, uh, some businesses realized that, that even though the agreement was sold as a tariff-free trade, that's not always necessarily the case depending on what you can do. I think one of the kind of underlying impacts uh, for the private sector is the fact that it's now more expensive and more complicated to trade with the EU. And when you have extra costs throughout the supply chain, there are only three things you can do with that extra cost. And one of them is to absorb that. And if you're a larger supplier, if you're a larger multinational company, that's much easier than if you're a smaller uh, SME um, and you don't have that kind of resources. The other response to extra costs is to pass them on to someone, which often is the, the final consumer. And then if you can't do any of these, you just stop trading. And we've seen examples of, of all of these responses. And I think one point to make is that that's, that's kind of exactly what's been happening. So that response from the private sector really depends on company specific factors, the size of the company, the industry the company is in. Some industries are more regulated than others. Their supply chain, who, where they're selling, where they're obtaining parts from. So it hasn't been the same type of response that we've seen from all of the companies. It's it's very it, it does differ quite quite substantially. But this underlying issue of extra cost and extra co complexity is something that we see throughout the entire supply chain. And, and when we're talking about the extra costs and the extra complexities, are those the main challenges that you see um, for businesses wanting to trade with the EU, but also other European countries like Turkey? Yes, the extra costs and complexities is, is definitely a factor. I would say that one of the things that that is not really, um, you know, perhaps highlighted enough is, is lack of knowledge, is the fact that you know, for companies that have been trading within that single market and, and have never experienced, uh, you know, the, 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 the joys of customs and, and border controls and inspections and paperwork and SPS requirements, that is quite uh, a change and it can be daunting for a number of companies and you don't always, you know, you're not always able to get help. If you're, again, if you're a large company and have that these extra resources, it, it's perhaps easier to get external consultants, to get someone to help, to get someone to explain these requirements. If you're a smaller company, that's obviously uh, a little bit more challenging. Um, and Pina, I'm specifically talking about um, Turkey. Obviously, I'd like to, to bring you in on, on this. Um, we know that trade between UK and Turkey um, is significant. There are high levels of supply chain integration. There's, there's big volumes um, of exchanges, bilateral exchanges in vehicles, engines and parts. Just talk us through, Pina, since the end of the transition period, the trading terms, um, how the trading terms have changed. Many thanks, Natasha, for having me on board, and many thanks to the SMMT as well for you know letting me be on this panel. The arrangement between United Kingdom and Turkey, of course, before the enactment of the free trade agreement between the parties, was on the basis of the Turkey EU Customs Union. And as all of the speakers have mentioned, when you are in a customs union arrangement, as it it goes literally, you don't have to do anything about the customs because there are no quotas and there are no tariffs which are being paid. Whereas, you know, due to the heavy uh, trade volume between uh, Turkey and the United Kingdom, and actually for over two decades, 
the automotive industry has traded finished vehicles, engines, parts and components between the United Kingdom and Turkey. So both of the parties have been enjoying tariff free and you know, you know, free of the rules of origin requirement. So these favorable conditions have allowed bilateral trade of automotive products between the United Kingdom and Turkey to prosper. But of course, following the enactment of the Turkey United Kingdom Free Trade Agreement, as Anna was saying, the rules of origin came into being. So the rules of origin mean, like all of the speakers have mentioned, lots of paperwork, lots of requirements, lots of you know, new conditions to, for you to prove that actually your product has been originating from that country. So therefore, I would say that the shift from participating to a common customs union then to trading on the basis of a free trade agreement had significant implications for the entire sector. Even though right now the United Kingdom and Turkey FTA allows all automotive goods to be eligible for tariff free treatment, tariffs could still be applicable if the respective exporters fail to comply with the New Deal's origin rules. And tariffs are not the only problems we have in international trade agreements. Apart from this, non-tariff barriers, which means the you know, different standards, different technical regulations which are applicable to products, also considerably hamper international trade. So I would say that following the transition uh, of the UK-Turkey free trade agreement, now that both of the parties have ratified the agreement, I think the, the, uh, the elephant which is sitting in the room is on the basis of the rules of origin annex of the free trade agreement between the parties, but also whether the standards which are now and the technical regulations which are now applied by the UK government will facilitate the import of products from countries, you know, especially from Turkey, considering the huge trade volume between the parties. So I would say both the paperwork in relation to the rules of origin, but also non-tariff barriers which are applicable to the trade between the parties, and for the time being, absence of the mutual recognition agreement for the technical regulations between the parties, Natasha. So, Pina, just going back to your um, elephant in the room that you were, you were talking about there, there are obviously considerable complications. What's the answer to sort that? Is it just educating people in, in how to navigate this or is it something else? Well, first of all, of course, education is always welcome. And especially coming from academia, I would all the more welcome the education. But of course, it's not only that. You know, there is much you can do uh, from both of the sides, uh, especially after having, you know, traded for so many years on a free basis. Now, especially the MSMEs in Turkey, which are, you know, practicing in this business, uh, may have, you know, difficulties to understand how all these procedures work. Because yes, to a certain extent, both the United Kingdom government and the Turkish government have given transition period to, you know, until a certain time, you know, certain arrangements between the parties, such as the marks for CE or the UK C8 marks will be, you know, used for, for instance, technical regulations. We need to actually accustom the producers, manufacturers, to learn how to produce in accordance with these new rules, but also for the paperwork which is going to be fulfilled at the border when you are complying with the rules of origin, these all may complicate life. But of course, I think here the most important thing is on the shoulders of the, you know, uh, both countries' exporters' assemblies, the NGOs which are representing the industry groups such as SMMT, and therefore I very much cherish this you know, event that they are, uh, they are organizing today, because the awareness can only come if we can talk about the nitty gritty details of how you're exporting things, even though there is a free trade agreement in play between the parties, just an agreement on the paper doesn't solve our problems. So we need to go into the practice of how you know, people will be accustomed and trained, especially at the customs with the customs officers, but also with manufacturers to get used to the new rules which are reigning the relationship between the parties. Well, Pina, thank you. Thank you for your kind words about today's event. And just on that subject, before I move on to my next question for the panelists, if you have questions, maybe specific practical questions about these issues that we've just been talking about, Pina's just been explaining how there's so much for us all to learn, swap knowledge about. So if you have any, uh, any experience with that, you have questions for the panel, just as the last panel, um, I do want to get as many of your questions, as much time for as many of your questions. So do start sending them in um, using the, um, uh, the, the question um, uh, thing 
seeing on the screen now. Um, so do, do keep sending and I'll have a look in just a few minutes to see um, if we've got, obviously on that uh, Turkish issue, but on um, anything else we're talking about um, as well. Um, Vonji, I want to have a quick look at, at future trends and, and collaborations. What do you anticipate, uh, maybe the risks, but also the opportunities associated with the potentially diverging um, vehicle legislation framework between the UK and Europe. So um, pros and cons, if you like, Vonji. Yes, I think at the beginning, it's, uh, it's important to, to mention that for any manufacturing, especially in automotive, economies of scale are important. So we still need a large volume for the UK and for Europe. And you know, most of half of the uh, UK production goes to Europe. So we can't afford to have two fragment, completely fragmented markets. We need, we need that for economies of scale. Now the risk we identify, of course, is a, um, a competition in over ambitious and unrealistic um, targets. So if we, if we go there, uh, of course, it's going to be a lose-lose situation because uh, it would really fragment the market and uh, volumes are not going to be there anymore to justify um, attractive and competitive prices or costs. Secondly, um, there are additional costs yeah, due to double certifications, which you would need to do, conduct in Europe and in the UK. So ultimately, the, some of these costs would have to be passed on to the users, which is not also the ultimate target. Looking at opportunities, we think that there are still opportunities not in diverging, but in speeding up, for instance, in the UK, a framework which allows emergence of technologies, maybe, which are still um, nascent or not advanced enough in Europe, but which can be fast-tracked here uh, in the UK. The UK has the advantage of speed, do not need to agree between 27 countries before taking ambitious legislation, but can has the now the autonomy to drive um, a technology or a uh, technology framework which allows them to be um, ahead of, uh, of Europe. Thank you very much. Um, so I can see that uh, you know, Bosch is, is already thinking about these issues um, in many different ways. Um, Sigrid, talking specifically about the UK um, market and the EU, two largest automotive trading partners in the in the European region. What what are the prospects as you see it for that relationship going forward? Well, just maybe also to, to echo a bit what um, my colleague just said on, on regulatory convergence. We still see a need and scope for regulatory collaboration between the UK and the EU, because indeed the UK may have the benefit of speed, at least in certain areas, and it's always good to, to see opportunities. And of course, uh, th th that's also what automotive suppliers are all about, looking for opportunities. But as uh, as one just said it, it's there, there needs to be scale in the end too there needs to be a market and you want to ideally also supply global markets um, because uh, that's what this industry does so there are really challenges um, maybe more than opportunities and and we would like to stress that um, there's further collaboration on on regulatory yeah, convergence or regulation per se remains uh, very necessary and we also believe that the automotive annex and also the joint working group on automotive regulations that they provide an institutional channel for it it's, it's just a bit unclear maybe uh, at the moment what direction the, the UK government likes to take on, on this one but I think it's it's fair to, to stress uh, the importance the, the continuing importance of, of this topic um, and then indeed, as you said, both um, the UK and the EU are, are you know, enormous trading partners. The UK also has an important market for vehicles uh, that, and, and is, is, it tends to be relatively new vehicle market. So the newer types, the newer models tend to find their ways to, to UK customers. So 
certainly important that uh, that these products, uh, the assembled vehicles, but also components, can find their ways in into the UK uh, market. So uh, absolutely important. Moving on to a slightly different area, um, the integration of European and British supply chains, specifically to produce electric powertrains, Sigrid. Yeah, that's absolutely a crucial issue because in industry, uh, apart from digitalization, uh, a lot uh, is about electrification. The biggest thing maybe that comes to mind immediately is the lithium reserves in Cornwall. Um, and as I said before, the UK electric vehicle market, which will remain highly important for the European region. Um, but the supply chain for electric powertrains is likely to be significantly less integrated than the existing powertrain uh, supply for, for internal combustion engines. So it's, it's, it's unlikely from our point of view that batteries, for example, will be shipped between the UK and the EU, um, although battery cells and, and other components could possibly or potentially be, be transported by, by trucks. But just to give you some numbers, the 22% of current EU-UK trade flows in automotive components, and that's export and imports, uh, concerns transmission components like clutches, like gearboxes, axles, and another 20% is probably related to engine and other powertrain components. Um, the EV, the electric vehicle drivetrain, has um, uh, way fewer moving parts. So that it directly impacts the, the, the import and export flow of goods and, and also the amount of work uh, to be integrated and therefore also has an impact on, on employment. So um, we find it at the moment quite hard to predict the integration of a supply chain for batteries, uh, for power electronics and electric motors between the two sides. And, uh, and what we do see is that currently most a component investment is happening when it comes to electrification in Germany and France, um, which also seems to make sense because these two countries um, may uh, also be good in the end for 60% of battery electric vehicles and plug-in hybrid electric vehicles production by, by 2025. So the UK share as it stands now is likely to fall to about 5%. Um, and um, yeah, foreign direct investments goes goes to other countries more than they go to the UK, and and I think um, yeah, that that's just something uh, we we also all need to be clear about. It doesn't mean that you can't have your business strategies. The UK have their uh, political strategy, of course, too, um, and that all remains important. But in the end, there needs to be a business model for any business, and and that's um, no no different for for businesses in the UK than it is for businesses um, in the EU. Thinking specifically about the, the attitudes or you know, the ways that the different regulatory bodies um, or policymakers approach these challenges, um, I just wonder if you were going to um, write a list of ways that that could be improved, what would be on your list? How would you bang those heads together? <laughs> Yeah, good question. It would be interesting to be a little fly on the wall, right? When when mm -hmm. when that happens too. No, but I, I, we believe that it's probably time that that policymakers manage a bit to get out of the uh, damage control and and zero sum game approach uh, when it comes to the EU UK relationship and and really start to look constructively at at the relationship more maybe than is happening today. So really a look at concrete issues on the ground. Uh, Co but also cooperate and align positions within UNECE, which is in, in Geneva, where lots of technical requirements are agreed and, and set. So to align industrial policy uh, items to avoid conflicts about state aid for batteries or for semiconductors, for chips, um, to continue to work also on ways to digitalize and, and simplify the paperwork connected to customs procedures, coming back to that again, because um, I mean, all of that can make things much more easy and, and avoid messy situations like we've seen in the period just after, after Brexit.
we've lost your picture for, for now, but I'm hoping we can still hear you because my next question uh, is for Anna, which is uh, we're talking about just following on from what we were saying with Sigrid, enhanced collaboration between the UK and the EU, but specifically to find technical solutions that might mitigate customs impacts in the future. I I is there scope for that? Are you optimistic about that? There's, um, there's plenty of scope for enhanced technical cooperation. And, you know, that's something that uh, was built into the TCA. We had provisions around uh, exploring different options. We had a proposed pilot project that would avoid duplica duplication of, of customs formalities. And, and all this was something that, you know, that has been discussed previously. And there's definitely scope for doing something going for further. You know, I think it's no secret to say that the relationship between the UK and the EU at the moment is slightly um, complicated, given the, the, you know, Northern Ireland and the protocol. So I think we're still very much in the in this in this space where we're looking at what's been agreed. So we're looking backwards rather than thinking of what can be done going forward. But there's plenty of scope both within the TCA, but also unilaterally by the UK and by the EU as well. So I think there's there's um, there's plenty that could be done. It's just whether or not there is this political will and uh, whether in, in, we're in that um, space where, where there is uh, interest in that. Yeah, well, I think that's... Um... Uh, something we'd all hope for. Um, Pina, just moving on um, to um, the, the partnership between the, the UK and Turkey on the basis of the new agreement, but particular in um, the development, production and commercialization of electrified vehicles, what do you, where do you see the opportunities there? How, how positively are you thinking about that possibility? Thanks, Natasha. I think there's a huge potential out there. And here, actually, I would also like to perhaps, you know, refer to the, you know, important report that the SMMT actually released today. And I would like to just mention a couple of, you know, numbers from the SMMT UK Automotive Trade Report. So according to the latest report, which was revealed this morning, Turkey is back into the top 10 export destination for UK cars. And in that capacity, it replaced Israel. So Turkey returns to its traditional export ranking with the United Kingdom after the anomaly that we have faced, of course, during the pandemic. So the United Kingdom export to Turkey uh, seems in that sense to have jumped and the bilateral FTA negotiations seem to have helped even further Turkey. So the share of the value of exports to Turkey grew from you know, 31.3% in 2019 to 35.9% in 2020. When it comes to the electric cars, actually over the last couple of months, there have been you know, various secretaries of state uh, who came to Turkey, uh, both you know, while she was not yet the you know, uh, foreign ministry, Liz Truss, and later on the Minister for Trade, uh, in United Kingdom because they have huge, you know, ideas for producing electric vehicles in Turkey. So I believe that, you know, this new partnership between Turkey and the United Kingdom, the free trade agreement, can actually serve both environmental and competitiveness objectives between the parties, ensuring that electrified vehicles, batteries, related technologies and raw materials can be traded between the parties. And, you know, when you look at the free trade agreements between the parties, you see that some flexibilities are already embedded into the agreement. And Turkey's new, uh, well, over the last two years, Turkey was working on a project, electric car project, which is TOG, with T-O-G-G. And I remember the talks which took place between the, you know, UK uh, government and the Turkish government on how to cooperate, you know, for the production of these new electric vehicle, which is being, you know, manufactured and engineered in Turkey. And I think from that angle, there is much to realize between the parties. And moreover, we know that last March, Ford company also announced that in, in its factory in Dagenham in East London, they will undertake certain, you know, uh, new uh, projects, which could also work perhaps in the future to, you know, certain collaboration between United Kingdom and Turkey for electric vehicles. So short of it, I think there's a huge potential. 
and uh, the positive developments are there, but then we need to talk about, you know, how the environmental policy will come into play with electric vehicle, also knowing that the, the project by the European Union on carbon border adjustment, if it's also being undertaken by the United Kingdom, what it can affect, we will also need to talk about this. Thanks, Natasha. Thanks, Pina. Um, and I want to talk again about um, borders and we've talked already about some of the negatives and the problems and the costs that have been um, ensued during the transition period. But I want to talk about some of the positives because um, the UK has stated its ambition is to make the UK border the most effective in the world by 2025. That's not very far away. How can that actually be achieved, Anna? Um Yes, I mean, Border 2025 is a very important initiative. And I think that's, again, one of the things we don't really talk about much is that trade facilitation really starts well behind the border. And there's so much that the government can do unilaterally to improve the flow of uh, goods across the border, starting from better procedures, clearer procedures, simpler procedures, moving to things uh, a little bit more complicated, like the single window initiative, which would allow all the information, um, trade information, financial information, uh, everything that needs to be um, passed on to authorities as a, within the process of import or exports to be fed into one system, one, one interface, which would be a great simplification for, for UK mm -hmm. traders. And then things like trusted trader, revamping what we have currently, um, the trusted trader program that we have currently, uh, adding new benefits, changing a little bit the requirements. So there's so much that the UK government can do and, and I hope will do going forward to get to that stage where the border 2025 uh, goals and ambitions are achieved. And, you know, yes, that's one side of the border, but equally that would really make a difference for UK exporters and importers. Yeah, yeah, it certainly will. Well, some somebody who it will affect um, is certainly Vonji. I want to bring you um, back into the chat now. Beyond, if you like, borders and customs, I just want to talk about UK competitiveness compared to the EU. When we're talking about things like um, incentives and, and, and testing products and software. So my question for you, Vonji, is how could the UK improve that environment for product development? And, and is the bidding process um, to access funded support flawed, do you think? Could it be improved? Yes. Uh, first, the UK is a good place to uh, to develop, to test, and uh, to try deploy connected and automated vehicle tests. It's a good place, but it has to be the best place in the world to do that. So, because there is ac access to talent here for software development, there is also a regulatory framework which allows uh, tests to be conducted here better than it can be done in Europe. But in terms of uh, incentives, we are still lacking the incentives for developing, not necessarily producing manufacturing, but developing software here in the UK. So we would very much welcome a, an ambitious and determined program to support that competitive advantage that the UK can have. In terms of incentive in general, uh, we know that in the uh, in the EU also there are big programs, uh, both on the EU level, but also in the different countries, even in different states, when we look at Germany, which are being deployed. Here again, the UK has to be uh, selective, but determined also in the programs that it wants to, uh, to support. And here we would welcome more clarity on the technologies, on the programs, um, the choices that are going to be supported here in the UK, because that helps also to uh, really unlock investments here. Um, at this stage, we're seeing intentions, which are good intentions, but we need to see more than that, more substance, more, uh, let's say, um, more measures, tangible measures in order to allow us to really um, come here, invest, and um, tap the opportunities. 
what you're saying is you need a bit more meat on those bones um, in some ways. I've got a very quick question that I'm just going to squeeze in before, and I've got about 30 seconds to do it. This is a question I think best um, for uh, Anna. question says, we have a period of easement on customs declarations for EU imports into the UK, but from January 2022, customs formalities will need to be made at point of shipment. Can we expect further disruption in January 2022? Are companies prepared and is there sufficient capacity for customs and border control? So, Anna, are we going to see chaos in January? I'm not sure about chaos. The, the answer to the question, the question whether companies are prepared, whether everything's ready is definitely no. Companies, um, well, that, that would depend. Some companies obviously have been ready and have been dealing with these customs declarations because even though there are uh, some easements, they have been um, required from the 1st of January of last year, but not all companies are, are fully aware of that. I think there will definitely be another period of, of, of confusion. I'm not sure about chaos and there will definitely be delays, but we are facing delays as it is. So uh, we'll see what the magnitude of that is. Definitely, definitely a challenging period ahead for, for many companies. OK, well, so, so not chaos. We'll say that that was me over-egging it, but certainly something for companies, organisations uh, to think about and to deal with between now and January 2020. That uh, brings me to the end.